continuing this morning our study of First Timothy, First Timothy chapter five. We'll pick up our reading this morning. We covered down through verse ten uh, last week, and we'll pick up uh, verse eleven and uh, go down and read down through verse sixteen this morning. First Timothy chapter five, verses eleven through sixteen. In this section, of course, we see that Paul has been treating and talking about treatment of widows within the church. We're going to continue that, and we'll finish up that section today, which Paul is treating this practical, what we would call a practical issue within the church during that particular time. And Paul says, beginning with verse 11, But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation, or you could say judgment, because they have passed off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips, busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachful. For some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them believe or let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened. They may relieve those who are really widows. So as we've said, we're dealing with this section of scripture. And Paul dealing with this says, how does the church treat widows? What qualifies as a widow that, uh, that is helped by the church? And of course we know all the way back in Acts chapter 6, uh, that right after the really the flourishing of the church there, the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, the 3,000 added to the church, that there came to be an issue, an issue regarding treatment of widows. As I've said before, there was no, as I said, no state system in that day and time whereby widows and orphans and the disadvantaged were helped. And so first, as we have seen in this, and we'll treat today, that it was up to the families, and if it was, there was no family, then uh, there was uh, the church uh, was to help. So we're going to continue with that. And we've talked about, uh, in this first section of Scripture here, down through the first ten verses of 1 Timothy 5, about who really qualifies for widow, uh, how those widows are to be treated, and so we're going to talk some more about that today. We talked about the older widows. We dealt last week with those that were that were 60 years old and under, and uh, what you do with with those. Uh, but it's only the ones over 60, he says here, that really qualify for that help from the church. And so in verse 11 here, he says, "Refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton." against Christ and desire to marry. Having condemnation, or we can interpret that word as judgment because they've cast off their first faith. Now, you know, Paul says here, younger widows should not be put on this list as far as for aid within the church. Well, why? Because there is the, you know, I think that what he's saying is there's this stronger possibility of them being younger, having stronger sensual desires than the older widows uh, that perhaps they're going to want a marriage relationship or a physical relationship uh, leaving the faith because of that desire and showing that they're not really of the faith they're not being well grounded in the faith and therefore come under the judgment and discipline of the church the judgment and the discipline of Christ in this um, and there's also that those that were younger, uh, their prospects for marriage were, they still had that desire for marriage. And there was the possibility that they might uh, marry. And, they, and then you don't want to have to deal with this. Well, does the church still support them or not? And there were those that perhaps, rather than seeking marriage, might just seek out a physical relationship with somebody. And then the church has to deal with that issue of immorality within the church like the Corinth church had to deal with there. So what Paul was saying is, is they refuse these, uh, these younger widows. And 
And I think that what the Apostle Paul's desire here was to protect both the resources and the testimony of the church in Ephesus. And I, and, I, and I agree with that. There are many in this day and time that think that the church is simply a, a benevolent organization uh, to hand out money. And that's the idea that some have. We uh, not infrequently have those that come to the church and say, well, I have this need. And they have, no, <clears throat> they have no regard for the church until there's a financial need there. Well, the primary function of the church is the preaching of the gospel, the building up of the saints, the equipping of the saints, the glorifying of God in its ministry. And I, while I, I'm, and I, I will say this, I am very frugal when it comes to the resources of the church. Now, if somebody is in need and they approach you, that is really between you and them and the Lord as far as helping people financially in those situations. But when it comes to the resources of the church, I believe that we need to be very careful in those things. And uh, I think that Paul did not want them, uh, the church coming into a situation where they were seen as supporting the lifestyle, perhaps, of someone uh, whose testimony was not right before the church and before the community. And I think that we need to be careful uh, about that. To look at that. And so I mean, and, and some would say, well, was Paul saying that, that all younger widows are are uh, sinful naturally? Well, no, he was not saying, I don't believe, that all the widows there within the church. I don't know how many there were within the church at Ephesus. He was not saying that all of those younger widows would turn away from Christ, but it may have been that Paul had seen that tendency within the church, within that community. Because we have to remember, Ephesus was not a Christian community. It was a pagan community. And it may have been the widespread practice of younger widows uh, in that community that uh, they uh, got off into sin. Uh, particularly sensual sin. Uh, sexual immorality. And it may have been some that had professed faith at some particular point in time within the church at Ephesus uh, had reverted back to their old lifestyle. And so I think that what Paul uh, was saying here is to use practical wisdom in this matter of support of widows. And he says, then we move on to check verse 13. When he treats this farther. After they, he said they had this condemnation because they cast off their first faith. Uh, he said... They've made a profession, but it seems in their lifestyle that they, that they it was only a profession. It wasn't a reality of faith. It wasn't really true faith. And he says, besides this, these here uh, that have cast off their first faith, uh, or seemingly just have an outward faith and not really an inward faith, he says, besides they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, Saying things which they ought not. And again, he's not speaking this of, I think, of all younger widows, but of those who have cast off their first faith. And when, I, when I thought of this, when he's talking here about these that have cast off their first faith, when he's speaking of this, and I thought of, of Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. Uh, this doesn't speak just generally of... of uh, younger widows, but this speaks of those who cast off their really seemingly had a profession of faith. In verse 20 of Matthew 13, Christ gives an explanation of this parable of the sower. He said, He who received the seed on stony places, is this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. There seems to be a profession of faith. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he stumbles. He says, now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. He becomes unfruitful. And I think that this is the type of, of person that Paul is talking about here. Someone who seemingly had a profession of faith, but they cast off this, this first faith seemingly because it was just really an outward profession. 
But he says there, these of this type, they learn to be idle. They learn to be idle. Now, what, what, what does idle mean? Idle means, in my estimation, they're not busy in a uh, productive way. They don't work. There's nothing that they're doing. Uh, they have too much time on their hands. Now, there, there was, there's an old saying, and, and it's, not, it's not a biblical script, it's not a scripture, so don't say this and start looking for it. But you've heard this saying probably that idleness is the devil's workshop. In the lives of those who are unregenerate, there is some truth to that saying. Idleness breeds time for men and women in sin to, to uh, do the devil's work. Let's just say that. Uh, I thought about this morning as I was talking about this, this, this idleness of those of these younger widows who have cast off their first faith. I thought about the opposite. You know what the opposite is? The Proverbs 31 woman. The Proverbs 31 woman is a busy woman. Now, not just busyness for the sake of it, but busy in regards to her husband and to her children and to her family. And if you look over there, and I'm going to turn over there for a moment. If you want to turn, that's fine. I'm, but just to point out some things here, that that is so the opposite of what we see here when it talks about idleness and, and what goes on in the, in the lives of these idle women. And if you look here, verse 12 it says, when she's talking about the heart of her husband safely trust her, he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She's like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's night. Ladies, how many of you rise, how many times, risen while it's still dark to prepare for your family for the day? She provides food for her household. She gives a portion for her maidservants. Now, there's not any maidservants around most of our houses, I don't think, but then that was not uncommon, perhaps, in that day. She considers a field and buys it. Prophet, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength. She strengthens her arm. She's working. She proceeds that her merchandise is good. Her lamp does not go out by night. Not only does she get up early, she stays up late. Most moms that I know of don't get as much sleep as the husbands do. They're taking care of things. She stretches out her hands to the distaff. Her hands hold to the spindle. She's making clothing. No. Walmart or no clothing stores in those days. There may have been some markets, but for the most part, she's going down. She's making clothes for her family. She's not afraid of snow for her household. She's not afraid to get out in the cold. Her household is cold with scarlet. She makes tapestry. She makes her own clothing for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gate. She speaks well of her husband. He sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments. She sells them. She supplies merch, some sashes for the merchants. She gives there again. She's really a lady of industry in a sense of the word. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth. She's also a wise woman. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household. She's busy doing that. She does not eat the bread of idleness. There's no idleness involved in this woman's life. Her children what? Rise up and call her blessed. Now, that doesn't mean every day they're going to rise up and call you blessed, ladies, as they ought to. But her husband also, when he praises her, now husband, you ought to be praising, we ought to be praising our wives daily. Okay? That's just a little aside. That's really not part of the message, but we ought to be doing that. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own words praise her in the gates. This is the opposite of what Paul is saying here. This is a woman who doesn't eat the bread of idleness. But the ones who eat the bread of idleness, who have too much time on their hands, they're not working, they're not being busy, they, they have a tendency for carrying all sorts and generate all sorts of problems. And I think problems within the church. It's all, and I 
as I thought, but I thought about our culture. I thought about how many people in our culture don't work, don't seek to work. We have breathed a lazy, idle society in many ways. <clears throat> we have. Uh, over back over in Second Thessalonians chapter three, verses. 10 through 12, Paul said, Therefore, even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we, show, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. They're not working. they got too much time on their hands. They are busybodies. They're meddling in people's affairs. In the affairs of people that they should not. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. These are idle. They move about from house to house. It says here, not only idle, but they're gossips and busy by We all understand what a gossip is, do we not? They bear tales. They bear tales among the brethren. In fact, that's one of the seven things that the Lord hates is those that, that sow so discord among brethren. And that comes, a lot of that comes from gossip. From telling things that are not really true. Proverbs speak to, to much of that. Eh? Back over, there's several scriptures that I could use in this regard when it talks about this. But in Proverbs, only chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, and there in verse 13. Scripture there says a tale bearer reveals secrets. And he is of a faithful spirit conceals matter. In chapter 20 of Proverbs, there in verse 19, Solomon writes, He who goes about as a tale bearer reveals secrets. Therefore do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. If someone comes to you with some gossip or something, you know what you should tell them? You're not going to participate in it. Because it causes trouble. It causes trouble in families. It causes trouble in churches. And I have seen it in my life. And in chapter 26, there in verse 20, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. What's that have to do? But where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. Gossip and tail bearing. In busybodies, it gender strife within the body of Christ. And this is what Paul is saying here. That these uh, bring up rumors, they don't speak truth. Uh, they would be the kind who would stir up problems in the church through their gossip and speaking things which they should not. A good rule, if it's not for edification, it should not be spoken within the church. Verses 14 and 15. Paul goes on to say, Therefore I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. Paul gives, I think, both spiritual and practical advice here to the younger widows. Paul's advice to the younger widows was to marry and bear children. Just because their first husband had died did not mean that they could not marry again and have the privilege of having children. He's, you can see here, speaking to those that are still of childbearing years. And that was probably not very, uh, was not something that, that did not happen very often in that society. It was not an unusual thing for husbands to die young. The life expectancy of that particular time and period was not what it is now. They didn't live up until their 70s and 80s back then. Probably more than life expectancy for many of them was 30s and 40s. It was not unusual for there to be young widows. Well, are they supposed to think, well, I have no life now. I'll never have a chance of having a home and a family. No. Paul said, uh, he said, what I would desire is that these younger widows marry and they bear children and they manage the house. Now as I thought about this, I thought about the, the, 
the difference that there is in our society today toward this idea of marriage and having children. Very often in our society, marriage is seen as something which hinders a young woman's freedom and career opportunities. You, know, you don't need to get married. You need to seek first what you want to do. Your career opportunity. But in the scriptures, marriage is elevated. Marriage is exalted. Having children is exalted in the scriptures. A couple of different reasons for that. Number one, as we've already read, we read this morning back over there in Ephesians chapter 5. About the husband and the wife relationship. Verse 31, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The reason that marriage is exalted, number one, it's ordained of God, <laughs> but it pictures the relationship of Christ and the church. It pictures that. There's nothing else in the world that does that. That alone pictures the relationship of Christ and the church. It should be exalted. The love of a husband for his wife should picture the love, the sacrificial love and that Christ had for the church. And also there, the submission of the wife to the husband speaks of the submission of the church to Christ. We're here to serve and to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our head. Also, our culture often sees children as a burden. Do they not? You know, I, I hear this uh, sometimes. You know, about people especially that have a lot of children. Here, you know, I've heard, I've made reference to some families that I know that have, well, a lot, I have four children, okay. There's other children, families that I know that have six and eight children. People go, oh, how do you do that? Oh, I, you know, I don't know. And, and they say, how can you do that? Why would you want to do that? Well, because they see children, as the Scripture says in Psalm 127, verse 3, are a heritage of the Lord. They were a blessing. And in that culture, they were seen as a blessing. Children were seen as a blessing from God. I count every one of my children as a blessing from God. Some days more than others. <laughs> but I do. They are a blessing. They are a gift from God. And I think that, that Paul is magnifying this here. He says, you young widows, I urge you get married. Have a husband, have children. <clears throat> because it brings honor and glory to God. And I, and I think about this. I think about what a blessing. What an opportunity that a young woman, a young mother has to raise up children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and to change a culture. I pray that in this day and time we look at our culture and we look at it and we think, oh, it's all done. But, but God could in this day through Christian families and Christian mothers who minister to their children in the home, raise up a generation that loves the Lord and calls the nation back to the Lord. I think about a, a, about a, a Christian, the Christian mother of, of John Newton. Now here was a man that had, was a rebellious sinner, wicked man, but he had a Christian mother and she continued to pray for him. One day God regenerated him, saved him. Others throughout history that, that God has used the, the women and the, and the mothers uh, of that, you know, to, to raise up uh, godly children. And what Paul says in this, and in so doing, these young widows will give widows will give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. There won't be anything that they can look at their lives and say, oh, look at that life. Look, and the world's just looking for something in your life and my life to reproach us for, 
to bring defamation upon the name of Christ. But if a young widow gets married and she has a husband and she has children and they're raising those children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and doing uh, that which pleases God, then there's not going to be any rightful uh, defaming of the name of Christ that they can give and that they can do. You know, the Scripture says, and He says here, don't give opportunity to the adversary. Let me tell you, as the Scripture says, uh, the devil who walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, he's looking for opportunity to bring shame, shame upon the name of Christ. Paul was saying here, if you do these things, then uh, you will not give uh, opportunity for the adversary to bring defamation to the name of Christ. Paul warned this. He said, and Paul warned that some had already turned aside after Satan. What I'm convinced of here is that there were some, like, as Paul talked about, Demas has forsaken uh, has forsaken me having loved this present world. There were some of these, I believe, younger widows that had named the name of Christ at some particular point in time, but they had now turned aside after Satan. They had, they had turned aside from Christ. And what a great tragedy and what a great reproach this brings to the church. And then, in verse 16, Paul ends up this section here with saying, if any believing man a woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Paul again is reaffirming that the primary responsibility for the care of widows falls on the family. You look back at chapter 5, look at verse 3 and 4, honor widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. And you look on down at verse 8. He says there, but I, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, or what we would say, even an infidel. The first responsibility, I believe this, the first responsibility for taking care of these widows, is, as he says, the children and the grandchildren. That's the first responsibility. This frees the church when the family does what they should do. And this frees the church to provide for widows who have no other means of support. Already made reference back over to Acts chapter 6 where there were Grecian widows that are not being taken care of. Likely did not have families that could take care of them. And there was provision made for them. I do believe that, that when there is not family to help, that the church should step up and should, in a biblical manner, examining Scripture, support these widows. And it is a blessing. Even under the Old Testament uh, economy, the Old Testament, back in the law, speaks of the blessing that it is to take care of those who are widows. In Deuteronomy 14 and 29, it says, And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, may come and be, eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. I believe there's a blessing that comes in helping the widows that are widows indeed, as Paul speaks about here within the church. I do believe that, that we as a church need to be have our eyes open to the needs of those in our church that are widows and that need uh, have these necessities come about that, that we might be blessed by God. I believe it will be a blessing of God upon us when we do this. May we pray. Heavenly Father, Again, we thank you for this portion of your word. Lord, that Paul has given us clarity today. He has. Father, help us to see and understand how we as a church are to behave.
how we are to act, how we are to take care of those within our body. I pray, Father, that you would help us to, to see those within our body that have needs, to take care of those needs, but to do so in a way that pleases you. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would help us as we prepare for this time at the Lord's table. Lord, may we think seriously about the death of Christ, about His sacrifice for our sins, what He has done for us. I pray, Lord, this day that we think of all the things of Christ, that we think of Him. In your name we pray.